If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 5. We'll be in John chapter 5 in just a moment. Now, we're going to change uh, things up a little bit on Sunday nights. We've been studying through uh, several of our favorite songs, and, and we, I think we've come to the end of that study. We have exhausted that. And we're going to do something a little different for a couple of weeks and consider uh, some of the questions that Jesus asked during his earthly ministry. And clearly, specifically, some of the questions that we have recorded that Jesus asked during his ministry. To me, there's something very curious and interesting about the questions that he asked people. To me, there's something very curious and very interesting that Jesus asked questions at all. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was there in the beginning with God. He was God. He became flesh. He dwelt among us. From the very beginning he was there, he has the ability to know everything that there is to know. He didn't need to ask anyone to learn anything, to gain any knowledge. That's not the reason that Jesus asked questions. In John chapter 2 and verse 24 and 25, we read that he knew all men. He knew what was in men. Before he even spoke to a person, he knew what was deep within their heart, deep within their minds. Before he asked any question, he already knew the answer. And yet, hundreds of times in the New Testament, I believe it's hundreds of times, I haven't counted it myself, but I believe it's hundreds of times in our Bibles, we find Jesus standing or sitting or just speaking with some person and asking them questions. Why in the world did Jesus do that? Why did he ask questions? Sometimes he did it, I think, just to, to cause people, to motivate people to think about what was happening or to think about a subject. Sometimes he did it to maybe test a person's faith. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? I love you. Do you love me? He asked Peter. Sometimes he did it just to break the ice and start a conversation. It was that Samaritan woman at the well. He asked for a drink of water, and then he continued to ask about her life. One of the most interesting examples that I know is in John chapter 5. And, and read with me the first five verses of John chapter 5. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. Waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Here is this pool, very near uh, the temple in Jerusalem, maybe even connected to the temple there in Jerusalem. And the people of the day believe that if, or, or that at certain times, an angel will come down from heaven, will stir up the waters of this pool. And when that happens, the first person that makes it to the water and steps into that water, touches that water, that first person only is going to be miraculously healed. Whatever their ailment is, it's gone in that moment, in that moment of time. I want you to notice in, in your Bible, I imagine it's the same as mine. Uh, if your Bible's uh, newer uh, than, than ancient, I guess I should say, in a nice way. Uh, some really old Bibles don't have this, but at the end of, chapter, or the end of verse 3, uh, right after they were sick, blind, lamed, and withered, there's a bracket that begins a bracketed section of text. And I hope your Bible has that. And then in brackets we read, waiting for the moving of the waters. And very importantly, those brackets continue in verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. That little piece of scripture, the second half of chapter 3, or I keep saying chapter, the second half of verse 3 and all of verse 4 is not found in the oldest and best manuscripts. And everyone pretty much acknowledges that today, and so most newer prints of our text will have brackets on those words. And that's very important because it tells us that it is not by inspiration that John is stating an angel comes down and stirs up this water. 
It tells us, though, that it is what they believed took place. I don't think that's what happened. We don't have any evidence of that. That was probably added for clarification. And as we go through the text and go through this event, we see that that's what this man, our subject tonight, what he believes is going to take place. So it probably wasn't here in the original text. That's what the people believed. This man has been ill for 38 years. The text will tell us that Jesus sees him and he knows that he had been there in that condition for a long time. And I don't know if he sees him and he knows that he's been in that condition with some miraculous knowledge of Jesus. Or maybe it is just obvious when he sees him. Maybe this man has a prime location near the side of the pool that clearly he's been here for a while. Or maybe he is calloused in certain ways or his body has formed in certain ways that makes it very clear that he suffers from some form of paralysis. The Bible also in the text doesn't tell us uh, what his ailment is. It never specifies, if you go back into the Greek, and my text as I read for you, doesn't specify uh, what his ailment is. It just kind of tells us that he has a problem. He's had that problem for the 38 years. He's wanting to be healed, and we'll see as we carry on a little bit further that he has difficulty making it to the water. So here we have a man. He's been suffering for a long time, 38 years. He's lying by this pool, and he is waiting on an angel to come down from heaven and to stir up the waters. And then Jesus comes, and Jesus asks him a question. Look at verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? Jesus sees this man, knows he is suffering, knows he's been suffering for a great, great while, and he asks him the question, do you wish to get well? Do you want to? To be well, Do you want to be made well? Any of those questions uh, could, could, could be what Jesus asked. And maybe we read that question today and we see that and we think, here is this guy suffering. He's been suffering for so long and we imagine that scene and here comes Jesus walking in. And, and even respectfully, we hear that question and we think, you know what? That is a ridiculous question. Why would anyone ask a question like that? Of course this man wants to be well. Of course he wants to be healed. Of course his desire is to be well. He has suffered for 38 years. Here he is lying beside a pool for the sole purpose of being made well. Anyone in this condition could easily answer the question that Jesus asked. But I don't think it's a ridiculous question. And I don't think it's a ridiculous question primarily because it was asked uh, by our Lord. Everything that Christ did was perfect. All of his timing was perfect. All of his questions were perfect. All of his answers were perfect. Everything he did was perfect because he was perfect. There is a very important purpose in asking this question. As obvious as the answer might seem to you and I today. If you think about why did he ask it, what is the purpose? It may be that Jesus wants to cause this man to think about what could happen next. Do you want to be well? Have you thought about what happens if you become well? You believe you're, if you make it into that water before anyone else, you will be healed. Have you considered what happens next? If he was healed, his life would be completely different. 38 years in this state. If he was healed, he would no longer be maybe cared for as a beggar is cared for. If he was healed, he would now have to find secular employment, perhaps. Go out into the world and earn a living. If he was healed, uh, he, he would now be able-bodied. He would have to live according to God's commands in every way. Maybe that's what he wanted. But his life would be different in the moment that he was healed? Was he ready for all that? Was he ready for more than that? Was he ready uh, to deal with life after 38 long, difficult years? He had been surrounded for who knows how long by, as the Bible describes, a multitude of sick, blind, lame, and withered all around him. And Jesus asks, do you wish to be well? Are you ready? Is this really what you want? If we skip down to verse 14 of chapter 5, we, we learn a little bit more. 
It seems in verse 14 that his illness, whatever it is, was somehow caused by his own sin. In verse 14, he has now been healed by Jesus. That's the, uh, the spoiler alert. We know how the story ends. But he's been healed by Jesus, and Jesus finds this man in the temple. Verse 14 reads, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. Now, perhaps his ailment was caused by his sin. Maybe he just lived a sinful lifestyle and, and whatever his condition is, is the consequence of that sinful lifestyle. Perhaps Jesus is just saying, look, you've got this fresh start, uh, live a life that is free of sin. So something worse than being uh, in that state for 38 years doesn't happen to you later. Talking about perhaps eternal destruction or eternal punishment, the consequence of living a life of sin. Maybe Jesus is just saying, be faithful to God. But then we see that the man answers the question. And I want you to consider as we think about this, that this man could have very easily said no. Do you wish to be well? Do you want to be well? He could have said no. He could have just sat there and wallowed in his guilt if he had guilt associated with this. He could have said no. Maybe he could have said, you know what, I, I have deserved every bit of this at this point in my life. I realize this somehow must have been my fault. Or maybe he said, you know, the, the cards of life or the deck of life was clearly stacked against me. I, I've been incredibly discouraged after all of these years. Maybe he's become uh, incredibly comfortable with his physical life at this point. Uh, maybe uh, this grand change in life could be very intimidating. To make a life change after, after so long that is so significant, maybe he could have easily said, no, I, I kind of like what's happening. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. He could have easily, on the other hand, answered, yes, of course I want to be healed. Why would you ask me a question like that, just as we have already pondered? In verse 7 of chapter 5, the sick man answered him, Jesus, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. We know that this man had no idea who he was speaking to. He didn't know who Jesus was. Uh, if we skip down again uh, in verse 12 of chapter 5, um, there, it's after he's been healed and the, the Jews or the Jewish leaders are trying to figure out who it was that healed him. In verse 12, they ask him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? In verse 13, but the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't recognize Jesus as this great preacher or miracle worker. He didn't know what Jesus can do. He didn't understand that when Jesus said, do you wish to be well, that Jesus had the power to make him physically well and even more. And so he answers his question. And when he answers that question, I think what he does is he reveals how hopeless his condition seems to be. Do you want to be well in essence? And the man answers, what can I do? What hope do I have? Jesus is saying, do you want to be healed? And he says, I don't have anyone to help me get to the pool. Do you want to be well? And, and maybe he answers, someone always beats me to the water. If I could get to the water first, sir, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Then we see the result. In verse 8 of chapter 5, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well, and he picked up his pallet and he began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day, and so the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. The man is healed by Jesus, the Jews, the perhaps religious leaders of the day, maybe it's the Pharisees, maybe it's a mix of, of Jewish leaders. They see him walking and they see him carrying that bedding that he was laying on beside the pool. 
Maybe they recognized this man. Maybe they, they knew exactly who he was. After all, he'd been there for quite a while, but, but that's not what they're most concerned with. They're not excited that he's been healed. They don't really care about the fact that, these, that he has been healed of this ailment. What they want to clarify is that he is sinning in carrying his pallet on the Sabbath. And it is a sin to do that. At least it is in their minds. And so they see this man and they say to him, not, wow, this is great. This is grand. Finally, did you make it to the water first after all of this time? They don't say any of that. What they say to him is, you can't do that. In verse 13, but the man who was healed, again, did not know who it was. Let me back up. Verse 12, they ask him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? Verse 13, the man said, he who Excuse me. The man said, but the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Uh, he tells them, it was the one who told me to pick up your pallet and walk. It's the one who made me well just by speaking those words who commanded me to do this. After 38 long years, after who knows how long living in hopelessness, maybe shame, maybe embarrassment, not being able to take care of himself, this man comes along, he speaks words, and I am healed. He's the one that told me to pick up my pallet. He's the one that told me to walk. And again in verse 14, afterward Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. So what is the point? What is the reason that we have these words in our Bible today? What is the lesson that we can take away from this? Why did Jesus ask that question again? It was not so he could gain any knowledge from that man. It wasn't because Jesus didn't already know the answer or even that Jesus didn't know exactly how this man would answer. Jesus asked that question, not for his benefit, but for the benefit of literally every other person that would ever walk the face of the earth. For everyone who was present, for the Jewish leadership of the day, and for all of us today. That's why we have God's word. That's why we have every word that is recorded in our Bible. For the man that was there that day, maybe it was so that he could recognize his condition. Jesus is asking, do you want to be well? Saying to him, think about where you are right now. Think about how much you need hope. Maybe for us today, it is so that we can come to realize that no matter how deep the rut we are stuck in spiritually or how long we have been off track spiritually, no matter how harsh the consequence of our sin is in this life or how hopeless or stuck we feel spiritually, Jesus has the power to make us well. Not in a pool of water. Not when an angel comes down from heaven and stirs up those water. That power is found only in Christ to make us spiritually well. I will never be found lying beside a pool, waiting on an angel so that I can race to the edge of the water, maybe beat one of you there and be healed before you are. But every faithful servant of God has answered this very same question. Every faithful Christian has answered the question that Jesus asked on that day. Do you wish, do you want, do you greatly desire to be made or to get well. The question asks, do you have a problem? Do you know that you have a problem? Do you want that problem to go away? And every faithful Christian has recognized at some point that they have, that I have, that you have a problem with sin in our lives. For us, when we compare our lives to this man and the events of this story, for us, it is a little bit different because we understand, we know God's plan. The entirety of the gospel has been revealed to us through God's word. We know that, that Christ was buried. We know that he was raised on the third day. We know that he has ascended into heaven. We know that it is his blood that cleanses us from our sin. We know who Jesus is. We understand the power that he has. We recognize that. We recognize who he is and what he can do. And so when we hear that question, do you wish to be made well? We answer very quickly, very boldly, very loudly, yes. 
I want, I need to be healed. There is no way to be spiritually healed apart from Christ. And so tonight we ask that very same question again of all of us here. Do you wish to be made well? Are you tonight suffering with sin in your life? If you are, no matter how long that sin has been there, maybe no one knows about it except you and God. No matter how long that sin has been there, no matter uh, how habitual that sin may be, no matter how discouraged you might have become, just like for this man, Jesus is the answer. He is the only answer. And so tonight we offer the invitation to anyone who might need to respond. If you have never obeyed the gospel... The Bible teaches that if you hear the word of God and you believe God's word, if you are willing to obey his word, if you're willing to repent of sin in your life, turn away from that sin and turn toward God, if you are willing to confess the name of Jesus before men, confess that you believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is, in fact, the Son of God, that he can, in not so many words, make you spiritually well. You can go down into the waters of baptism and you can have your sins washed away. If you haven't done that, we invite you to make that decision tonight. Maybe you have been baptized, but you have sin in your life. Maybe you are stuck in a rut of sin. And again, maybe no one knows about it except you and God. Don't leave this place carrying that burden of sin and separation from God. Pray to God for forgiveness of that sin. Repent of that sin. And if you need the prayers of this congregation, there is nothing we would rather do than pray with you and pray for you tonight. Whatever your need might be, we hope that you'll make it known. Come forward while we stand, while we sing this imitation song.